Believe it or not, Gary, I once spent six months touring around Scotland looking at vapour-proof fittings in wastewater and freshwater treatment plants. Wow, I've known you for three years, I probably would say, yeah, I can believe you did that. Yeah, but I was probably a little bit premature at the time, because right. it was a while ago, but now I think actually there's a great value proposition to move all those legacy fluorescent fittings over to LED, and if you haven't done that already, well, you should have done, but hopefully today we're going to take a really deep dive into it so you can understand some of the numbers behind it. And I think we've got a great product here from Luminar in the form of this Typhoon fitting. And when I got it out, I was super excited because I saw words that I was familiar with because I go back a few years as well. I saw four foot, I saw five foot and I saw six foot as well as single and twins. Got all excited because I'm thinking of those fluorescent tubes that you're talking about. Yeah, and I think that's where uh, where Lumino are aiming this at. It is that retrofit market where we think in terms of old money, what are we replacing? So I think first we should take a deep dive into the numbers. Before we look at numbers, let's look at some important letters, energy labelling requirements. Now the system has all changed. Products that used to be an A could be anywhere now when it comes to LED. This product is a C but when we look at the wider market and alternative fittings available, we see them all the way down at F, which makes a massive difference in the running cost per year. This is always one of my favorite part of any video because it always comes out as a value proposition. I see you using the five foot twin fit in there as our example. Yeah, so this is the, uh, the one that I found was everywhere. I don't know whether it's a water industry standard or not, um, but people sometimes struggle when it comes to the value proposition because you're trying to compare apples with oranges when it comes to moving to LED. So remember a T8 tube, if you looked at the data sheet, gives out just over 5,000 lumens. So then a twin, do the maths Gary? Yeah, it's about 10,000 isn't it? And I'm looking at that fit in there and that says six, eight and a bit. Yeah, so let's look at where that comes from and compare the real efficiency that we get from it. So we'll start with our twin 58 watt fluorescent fitting. Um, so obviously two tubes in there would be 116 watts looking at the data for the tube. However, we've got to factor in some control gear losses and I'll be generous and say it's got electronic gear in. So we're losing 5% of the power uh, in the ballast. So that gives us for that twin 58 watt, 122 circuit watts. Okay, so that's what it's actually using in order to illuminate the fitting. That's it. So that's that. That's the wattage. Then look at the lumen side of it. So two... Um, two T8 tubes um, at 5,200 lumens each gives us 10,400 lumens of light coming from the source tubes themselves. Okay. Yeah. However, this is where the lighting industry used to be fantastic at confusing us. You take what is quite an efficient lamp and put it inside a fixture. And because you've got reflectance in there, you've got to get that light through the diffuser. You actually lose quite an amount of light. So there's a figure quote called the light output ratio, which for a twin 58 watt was typically 65%. Wow, it takes a moment then it to sink in. We're at 65%. And then as I jump down a line, I see 6,700 and a bit. That's very similar to the 6,800 I quoted at the start of the box. Exactly. So that's where we get that, that number from. So then if we do the maths on that, our 122 watts and just, the, you know, 6,760 lumens actually comes out that the efficiency of the fluorescent fittings is only 55 lumens per watt. You know, not really that efficient. When you think a, a halogen lamp is typically 20 lumens per watt. That's the potential. So then let's do, uh, to get the energy labeling, uh, you typically look at the consumption per thousand hours. So we dial that through. That is 122 kilowatt hours per year, which at the current energy prices we're at, and this could change depending on when you're watching the video. I don't suggest it's going down anytime soon, but we are paying 40 pence a kilowatt hour. So this unit here, 48 pounds 80 per thousand hours to run that twin 58 watt workhorse that's absolutely everywhere. And everyone's eyes drop down to see a very smaller number. So how can you get to that considerably smaller number? Okay, so we'll look at this. So this, this twin five foot is um, 43 watts in LED terms and the math dead easy is 43 kilowatt hours per year. So that's, uh, yeah, we're saving two thirds of the energy moving to LED and only 17 pounds 20. So depending on where you're, where you're using that and uh, how much it's going to cost to do your retrofit, you could be on to a winner. Continuing on the theme of this video, which is you wearing an anorak, Gordon. I've been on farms on those cold mornings and I see those fluorescent light fins on and the light output seems terrible to me. Yeah, and that is another problem with fluorescent technology. It has a sweet spot in terms of its output, which is usually at room temperature. And as soon as you move away from that, particularly at the colder end, 
the light output drops significantly. And you, you might be on a project that actually has been designed to take that into account. Right. So it's always worth just checking what's the actual real lux level that's needed in that application and then working that back to see what you actually get. You may actually be able to drop in some instances from a, uh, from a twin down to a single in, uh, in luminar terms uh, and obviously bag some additional energy savings. However, regular viewers to the channel are probably now shouting at the screen, what about just retrofitting it with an LED tube and leaving the existing fit in there? Yeah, so LED tubes are, are great. You know, obviously, you do get an energy efficiency gain by doing that, and there's probably some good reasons to do that. If, you, if it's a real challenge to replace the fixture, yeah. you know, asbestos sealants and things like that always pop up uh, that people don't want to touch. But you're still putting something that's more efficient in what could be an inefficient body in terms of those old fixtures, and you're still going to suffer from that 65% light output ratio. Uh, absolutely. So really the, the process should be, if you can, to actually replace the fitting to get the maximum amount of benefit. Yeah, we always get that most benefit going for a brand new install of a, the most efficient fixture yeah. you can get. And these ones are, because you say the 160 lumens per watt actually leaving the fitting. Um, but you've put them through the trial, Gary, haven't you? You've had a little test to see what they like to install because obviously time is money when it comes to install them to get that value proposition. What did he find out? So for this install, I thought I'd give Rick a little bit of a break and I'd do the install work, come out of retirement. And it is really cold at Lineside Studios, so it was quite nice to be moving a bit quicker and keeping that warmth up as we replaced our magnetic fittings here at the studio. So how it comes, we've got the bracket that will hold it on the scene. I'm gonna hang the fittings that I'm gonna install. And we've also got a gland here, and this is something a little bit different. I noticed on the photographs that we saw earlier in the presentation that the actual cables were coming in the end of the fittings. And what's great about these Typhoon ones is they've got a threaded insert at the end, so a stuffing gland can go in, and I'm gonna do that. So a loop in and a loop out system. I'm removing the old fluorescent light fitting, obviously we just hang simply the new one up and I'm going to use these wall raven clips designed to go onto a purling or girder using Ken's hammer. So everybody knows that is a really old hammer, couldn't find the ones that we usually use around line side studios. Sometimes these fittings come like a Meccano set. The good news is this one is fully assembled. The gear tray is retained with these straps. Hanging the fitting up, now I've got to make a decision on what happens to the cabling system that's already in place. And on inspection, I haven't got a permanent line connection in there. And one of the fittings I'm going to install is an emergency one. So I'm going to take out my steel or armored cable, love your comments on this, and I'm going to put a tough sheath cable in, so no armor armoring within that cable and I'm going to bring it in from one end and I'm going to go out the other end and the one that I've brought in now brings in my permanent line switching line neutral and a protective conductor I'm just going to fold out the gray conductor out of the way I'm not going to use it I'm going to make my connections into the push fit connectors within the fitting and I'm going to oversleeve the black conductor as my switching line. I'm going to continue the feed on to the next one. This time I'm not going to take a permanent line through. It probably would be a case that you would normally carry that permanent line connection through in case you've got several fittings and every third one says an emergency fitting. I've only got one more fitting to go to, so I'm going to use a standard three core cable in order to make those connections. And then that's it really. It's nicely, easily connected by coming in each end of the fitting. I can now put my cover on and use those clips to hold it back into place before then looking at energizing the circuit. Yeah, well, I know it's on the box here, Gary. This uh, obviously we've stepped up in IK rating because our existing uh, fluorescent ones were, I'd say, IK zero because <laughs> yeah. we just had the, uh, the glass tube in. Uh, these are IK08, which obviously means that they're tough for that intended application. IP65, uh, as you'd expect. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of that is down to how you install it. It's interesting. A lot of the water treatment plants seem to prefer coming in the ends. Yes. Uh, where obviously you can drill out the back and mount, to, mount the conduit systems if you wanted to as well. And I think it's the first time I've had a fitting with that threaded insert. It was so easy. Gland's already got a little O-ring on it. Obviously the gland goes in and yeah, it, it's fitted itself really. Yeah, and, 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 and cheeky, using, uh, not using the armoured cable meant you could use the supplied glands that come in a little accessory pack there. Uh, and there's actually two of them as well, which is good. Yeah, it's that massive debate though, isn't it? We put armoured cables in loads of locations that never get interfered, ladder racking, cable tray, basket, maybe even on a bit of a roller tray, what actually ever gets near it. That's it. And uh, another feature I like is, yeah, is that additional terminal in there that you can loop through, uh, even if this, so this version here isn't it's emergency. emergency. Yeah. If you're taking it through, you can loop that wire and through. When it comes to emergency, uh, these are self-testing which is obviously a great feature. You don't need to put in the, the old little key switch there to do your uh, weekly and your monthly test that everybody does, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Um, you've obviously got the status LED in there that flags up if you've got a battery fault 
and it gives you a little uh, indication that it's actually doing its uh, test that it should do. Obviously, you still have to do a visual check to look at the LED to get that status. And self-test mode as a standard, and when it's in emergency mode, the whole gear tray is illuminated with over 400 lumens of light output, which makes it easier for your emergency lighting design calculations. That's another great feature. They also do uh, occupancy sensor versions as well, because obviously the most efficient light is one that isn't on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in a lot of applications, plant rooms, things like that, you need lots of light when people are doing maintenance, but uh, when you're obviously not in the room, you don't want to leave the lights on. You certainly don't. However, we've looked at obviously what replacing, let's go fluorescent light fins because they're still using those four, five and six footers. However, it might be that you're looking at high bay lighting and looking to save money, energy and control there. And you can do that by watching the video on screen just there.